Welcome, everybody, to Season 3 of OmniSense Cart Insiders Podcast. I am your host, Greg Zakowitz. This season is all about email marketing automation and providing you with the information that you need to increase your sales and not your workload. It's like living the dream. Throughout the season, I'll be discussing high-revenue driving workflows with industry experts and companies who are executing them well. On today's episode, we're going to dive deep into Lapse purchaser emails with our special guest, Bezad Trinos, Chief Denim Otaku at Naked and Famous Denim. And trust me, conversation is a good one. So let's get this thing rolling by first welcoming back to the show e-commerce veteran Lucas Walker. Lucas, nice to speak again, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much for letting me come in to the co-pilot seat with you this season. So today we are discussing lapsed purchaser emails and the conversation I'm having after hours today, Lucas, is with uh, Bezad Trinos from Naked and Famous Denim on how they're executing their lapsed purchaser emails. And their interesting story with them because their lap, their jeans take, when you buy a pair, right, you need to break them in and you break them in over the course of a year. So lapsed purchaser for them comes in different stages. So I'm going to talk to him all about that stuff. Really interesting and in how to apply that to your own business. If we look at our benchmark report for 2020, looking over 10 billion emails sent, elapsed purchaser mm-hmm. messages last year, open rate 24%, which is really good. Click-through rate 13% and a conversion rate, surprisingly 21% for those messages, which is really interesting. And we'll dig into that a little bit here. Lucas, lapsed buyers are tricky for me. You have experience running an e-commerce brand, so I can't wait to get your thoughts on this. But there are so many reasons someone be- can become a lapsed buyer. It could be bad experience. They might just not be ready to buy again. Something changed in their life. And you probably have a story around that because you were dealing with pets, right? So you have a lifespan, lack of a better term, but it's a lifespan, right, of a pet? Well, it's a morbid fact of... And unfortunately, there were a few replies to emails where it was very sad that their their pet had passed away, and that's why they hadn't purchased. So we have all these challenges, right? And there's more reasons. I'm not going to list them all here. So my question to you, Lucas, is you were knee-deep in this with trying to figure out how to approach these people. How do you approach lapsed buyers when you don't know why they haven't returned the purchase again? Well, I think that one is knowing really what the next purchase could be. So in the case of Naked and Famous, where it's high quality denim that lasts a while, they might only buy one pair of jeans and just wear them for two years. But it could be they don't know about other products that you have. So I think that's the first thing to dive into is what type of business are you? Are you more consumable where it makes sense? Are you more annual? Or are you a more educational, longer lasting, higher ticket item like Naked and Famous denim? In the case of Naked and Famous, it might just be an education piece of, hey, you bought these these jeans and taking your products and putting them into buckets of styles and say, hey, here's what else goes really well with this look. So I think it could be a couple of things, both on the education piece as well as the just, hey, I'm not being very eloquent with my, my copy right now because I'm coming off of it off the top of my head, but it could even just be educating customers on what's normal, what's What's a pattern? And it could be saying like, hey, most customers have have repurchased by now. Was there anything wrong with your la- last order? And then you can really leverage that to increase your LTV and say, you know, never forget to reorder, go on subscription. And that can be a huge driver as well. So it could be just presenting that reorder or that next order in a way that the customer didn't even think about it. Is that what you guys did with your brand? Yep. So for us, it was because it was a dog treat and a consumable product. Our goal was to get people to three orders as fast as possible, because by that point, people are comfortable going on subscription, saving a little bit of money. And that's also how we approach discounts where, hey, if you want a discount, buy a mix pack, buy a case or go on on subscription. But for a lot of customers who may not know that that's an option or they may not have to worry about selling out, There was also sort of trying to get that information of, do they have a big dog or a little dog? If you have a little Dachshund versus a huge Great Dane, the amount of product you're going to consume is just going to be different. Was there anything you learned from your strategy going through that you had to either pivot or shift with, whether it's copy, send times, uh, what you consider lapsed, information you collected? Obviously, type of dog, probably important to your last point there, but 
any type of pivots you could think about that you guys did? Yeah, so just eventually following the, the data enough, we could really do a blended average to say, what is our ideal purchase or order and try to steer people that way. So in our case, if they could either do a half case or a full case subscription every three to four months, it wasn't asking them to buy too much product. It was reducing our, our shipping and logistics costs. And it was also making it in a way that made sense for them. So it's also reducing their their environmental impact or their carbon footprint of ordering. So I think that there are a few ways there to look at it, but really start to look at how often are your repeat customers coming back and placing those orders and using that to then almost create a new welcome series as a date or compelling event to, to order by. So if you know that on average, customers order maybe every 75 days, 60 days after purchase, maybe start sending a little bit more of a sales email to warm them up. And it could be something as simple as, hey, are you running low? And for, for us on the packaging, the, we sort of had a fun little refill mark with uh, the dog's belly. So the, the soda client could have been, hey, is your dog's belly getting empty? It's kind of something interesting. Go look into the email, show the product and say, hey, if your treats are below this level, it's time to reorder. Here's a link to do so. Very good. And how about things that either you overlooked or you think brands today commonly overlooked when it comes to lapse purchase, uh, lapse purchase messaging? I think the one of the biggest thing things that brands overlook is assuming that that purchase rate will be the same for each product. So in the case of Naked and Famous Denim, if I just bought a bunch of of denim, or let's say I just bought a new a new denim jacket and it was maybe three hundred bucks. I probably don't want to buy another item that's $300 right away. So maybe in that case, it's coming and saying, hey, you know what? Last call, we want to make sure you hear it first. Here's what's on sale. And just sending that clearance message. So I think it's important to kind of stagger it and have different options of what's for sale, what's not for sale, and changing up that messaging because people aren't going to buy necessarily the same big ticket item every single time. Excellent. And this might feed into the last question I asked you too. So if there is a difference there, feel free to expand. If it's the same answer, feel free to just let me know it's the same answer here. But I've been asking you about pet peeves that companies do when it comes to yeah. messaging. How about lapse purchase or pet peeve? I think assuming that I've used all the product where and give that sort of opt out by, so let's say it's a replenishable product. So some some hand cream or some some hand sanitizer. If I bought a bunch and I still have some, I'm not going to repurchase. And have that w- reason as a way to opt out of these emails because the last thing you want is somebody who's been a successful, loyal customer to mark you as spam. So I would say just give an easy reason for customers to give you feedback of, no thanks, I still have lots. Or nope, still in great condition. And then use that to maybe skip the rest of the flow or just delay it for a little bit, depending on how crazy you want to get. But don't forget that these are people who have given you money. You really don't want them to be hitting the spam in the spam folder. That doesn't always have to apply just to lapsed purchaser as well. Just two days ago, I got an email about upcoming Father's Day promotions. And the whole email was, hey, we're going to start sending Father's Day emails to you, right? So we understand it could be a delicate time for some people if you don't want to receive Father's Day emails to opt out, right? So you could get that. So I completely agree with you as far as lapsed purchaser goes, but it could also apply to other areas of your business based on peak seasons or something where we talked about very briefly at the beginning stage, like there's a morbid factor to some things as well. Mm -hmm. There is, and it's just, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes just make it really easy for customers to to opt out of whatever you're sending because it might be something sensitive that you have no idea about and you need to to remind yourself of that. You're you're in your business day in, day out, but customers aren't and they have so many more important things going on in their lives and be, be sensitive to that fact. Excellent insights. I think that sets us well for a conversation with Naked and Famous here. So Lucas, uh, Lucas Walker, everyone, Thank you for your time again and for joining me this season. If you want to contact Lucas, know more about him, the podcast he runs, be sure to check out the show notes. We'll have all that information down there as well. So be sure to uh, to send him your thanks and for all the great insights. But check out the show notes. 
And uh, we'll shift over to our next segment with my conversation with Bezad Trinos of Naked and Famous Denim. I'd like to now welcome to the show a self-described denim nerd, Bezad Trinos, Chief Denim Otaku at Naked and Famous Denim. Bezad has helped develop an automated email strategy that now accounts for 20% of their email marketing revenue. And part of that automation includes lapse purchase messaging, which sees a 16% conversion rate with those messages. So I would like to dig into the ever-challenging topic of winning back LAPS customers through the email marketing channel. So Bezad, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here, man. My pleasure. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So we chatted for about half an hour before we even got onto recording this here, uh, mm-hmm. which is always nice. We talked everything, ear, nose, and throat to uh, to politics. So it's been a good mor- uh, good night so far. I guess good morning for you. Good night. For good me. morning for me. Yes, That's it's right. my favorite two topics, ear, nose, and throat, and politics. <laughs> We're going to shift to something uh, quite different, lapse purchaser messaging, with, which has nothing to do with either of those things we talked about before. But <laughs> But we're going to jump in. Hey, before we get into it, though, can you give us just a quick rundown about who Naked and Famous is and uh, just kind of do a real quick setting of who your typical customer might be? Yeah, well, we're a denim brand based in Montreal, Canada. We import denim fabrics from Japan. We are also known for being quite innovative in this space. We create a lot of interesting and innovative and new and wacky denim ideas, as well as creating a lot of stuff that is very rooted in denim history. So we're a bunch of denim nerds. And we like creating weird denim fabrics. And as a result, we've, we've developed quite a, a fan base among uh, denim enthusiasts around the world. So people who are just really interested in odd and interesting fabrications, people who, who really like, uh, you know, the traditional aspect of the way we make things. So we've got a very interesting customer base of enthusiastic denim lovers. Very good. And we're going to talk about email today, especially the lapse purchase messaging. Real quick for the audience as well. How many people are on your email marketing team? Oh, just me. Just you. All right. One person show there. Yep. And then quickly, uh, which e-com platform do you guys use? We're using Shopify. Excellent. So I think the story that we hear, at least the customers I talk to a lot, and you'll kind of see this even with larger companies that I've worked with, right? One two-man person or two-person show kind of doing the email is pretty typical, even for larger companies. Sure. You might have three. So I think the, the advice, the, uh, kind of the framework you provide today is going to be very relatable to a lot of people because they are just one person shows here as well. So I appreciate the background and I'm excited to see what you guys or what you've been able to do just kind of running this thing off kind of on your own. So when we talk about winning back laps purchasers, you know, on how email plays a role into that, obviously there's other marketing channels that play a role that might overlap with email a little bit, but I want to dig into the why and some of those tactics for you. The last time I checked your numbers, and yes, I jumped into your account, looked at your numbers here, but we were seeing open rates around 35% for lapsed purchase messaging, eight and a half click-through rate, and I mentioned before, 16% conversion rate. So all pretty good numbers, if you would ask me. I want to dig into how you're getting those numbers, the strategy you're taking, what those messages look like. But I think the most important thing here might be is, uh, which can be often ambiguous, what do you guys consider to be a lapse buyer? Is it someone who hasn't bought in the next period of time? Are there other criteria? But how are you guys deciding what that is? I think for the most part, it's, it's a customer who hasn't been a customer for us in a while. And the thing about raw denim is that we encourage our customers to wear their jeans for a long time. You know, but the, uh, for, for those people who don't understand what raw denim is, it's basically unwashed, untreated denim, the same Basically, the the fabric, the way it came right off of the loom. So we, we take that fabric, we cut it, we sew it up into a pair of jeans, customers wear it. So there's no wear and tear and, you know, fake uh, kind of uh, uh, wear patterns on those jeans. But what our customers like to do is they like to wear their jeans for a very, very long time to develop those wear patterns on their own. So the, all of the fades, increases and rips, tears, all that stuff will be unique to them. But that takes a long time. So usually we'll tell customers between six months and a year, you don't wash your jeans. Not, not necessarily don't. I mean, there's no, there's no hard rules with this stuff. But a lot of customers, you know, that's kind of the, the framework that they work within. So for at least a year, sometimes more or, or often more, customers are wearing a single pair of jeans every day, day in, day out, so that they can develop that personalized fade pattern on their jeans. So a lapsed customer for us isn't necessarily someone who hasn't shopped with us, you know, within a certain amount of time, because they might be working on this pair of jeans to get them to to look the right way. And, you know, once a customer kind of has that look, 
they'll often come back to uh, start over, you know, start a new project. So for us, it's all about making sure that even if a customer is in the middle of working on a pair of jeans, they're seeing all of our relevant information. They're knowing what's going on. Maybe they're pre-planning for a future purchase. So we like to send out these emails to all of our customers to let them know, here's what's coming up. You know, here's, you know, our, our latest live stream that's coming on online. And we will kind of encourage them to see what's going on and, you know, be in their mind for when they're ready for that next purchase. How are you determining the time frame right now for your lapse purchasers? Did you, because you, you have this really elongated, you know, shopping window where, mm-hmm. like you said, they're buying and it might be a year or so before they come back. You get some that I assume, and certainly correct me if I'm wrong, that might be wearing them. They start to see a pattern start to develop and they get excited about it and they come back to purchase something else. They'll maybe want to work on two at a time, different color set or sure. something. But how did you determine what that time frame is right now? Because you do have that longer window. So I guess the follow-up is, do you change that just to, to test them out? So what I've done, I have a general, like, you know, we haven't seen you in, I think it's, it's, 90 days. Okay. So if we haven't seen you back on the website within 90 days, you know, we'll send you just a friendly reminder. Hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's new. You know, and these are specifically targeted to those people who, who haven't been back. And then we also have another automation set for customers who we haven't seen in a prolonged period of time. I think this is people who, who haven't shopped with us for over a year. Okay. So we have a pretty good return customer rate, it's well over 50%. So most of our customers are, are are repeat customers. So for those people who haven't shopped with us in a while, you know, we send some friendly reminders uh, to them every every now and then. Very good. And you guys are currently sending a three message series on the lapse purchase side. You mentioned some of the message types here, right? You're trying to draw them back. Do you guys in general as a, as a brand, do you discount as a brand or are there no discounts? So actually, one of the things that we do is for our email uh, uh, newsletter subscribers, every week we have a, we we call it a 24-hour special. So there's a a secret item on sale every week that you will only learn about through that marketing email. We don't publish it on our other social medias. We don't don't publish it on our Facebook or or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that. So if you want to find out about that sale, you got to be uh, signed up for our newsletter. And we let people know, hey, there's there's actually secret sales going on. We're not going to tell you what is on sale, but if you sign up for our newsletter, you will know about it. So that's one marketing email that we do. Another one that we generally have is uh, during special holidays, Labor Day, uh, 4th of July, Canada Day, um, Thanksgiving, Black Friday, uh, Boxing Day in Canada, we'll have uh, a store-wide sale that we advertise and we let people know and we have a just a general sales section on our website, which is for you know items that uh, maybe we only have a few units left in the warehouse, and it's just kind of stuff that we need to clear out. So uh, we do have some sales from time to time, but we generally don't discount new items, core items, items that we you know running items. Uh, those are always, generally speaking, regular price. So with your lapse purchase messaging, these messages you're sending out, do you discount all those or are they strictly informational, engaging, you know, peak your interest type messages that drive them back? They're peak your interest style messages with a, sometimes we'll offer a free shipping uh, coupon, Okay, but that's it. Like we, we won't reduce the price of, you know, I, I've seen other marketing tools where, you know, you go on the website, you look at something, and then like a day later, you get that automated email. It's like, hey, it's 10% off. And it's like, okay, that's that might work for them. But the nature of our business, I mean, I don't know what their margins are like. Our margins probably aren't as high as theirs. So just within our space, we are already among the best priced product of its quality class. So uh, in order to do that, we don't have the luxury of having a, a, a gigantic margin where we can kind of... I don't want to call other people fake for you know putting a certain price and then always offering things on discount, but we don't do that. We're, I think we're pretty honest with our pricing and you know the price is the price because it's, it is already the best price. That's fair. My wife always says, like, I... So whether it's a car, a house, or whatever, a pair of jeans, right? 
She's like, why can't just the price be the price? <laughs> it's just, just right. I don't want to get into this like haggling thing or like, oh, I forgot my I forgot my coupon today. You know, I'm completely with you. You know, I was actually having a, a discussion with my wife about this yesterday because she, we were comparing hair salons in Canada versus hair salons here in Japan, and she said that one of the biggest things that makes she's Japanese and in, there's not there isn't a, a, a tipping culture in Japan. They are aware that their tipping culture exists outside of Japan, but you know, it's always this weird dance you have to play at the end of you've got your hair cut and all this stuff done and here's the price and then like now how much am I supposed to tip and whereas in Japan it's just like here's the price (laughs) (laughs) you know she's like I'm getting the exact same thing you know and like it's this odd interaction because like you know here I paid for a service and I understand that we tip our hairdressers here in North America, but what is appropriate? Because I've just spent hundreds of dollars on my hair and at home I spend actually less for the same service. And now I have to figure out, is this a 10%, 15%, 20%? Just, just tell me how much the price is. I'm happy with my haircut. You know, I, I just want to know how much I'm supposed to pay you. <laughs> I'm going to spin this right back to to brand and marketing here. So I, you're probably well aware of this, right? We're talking about it now, but retailers for the past, I don't know, 10 years have really backed themselves, in my opinion, into a corner with discounting, right? Because it was first to try to get some business and then it was, well, keeping up with the Joneses and now it's just everyone's discounting. Extreme beliefs, right? So th- there's some brands, especially luxury brands that just do not discount, right? That's what makes them luxury brands. When you get into... Whether it's welcome messages, post purchase messages, lapse purchase messages, in this case, right? There's a, a really big focus on, or we need to build our brand the right way so that people understand that we're not always going to be offering discounts, or if they are a lapse shopper, right? We're not going to win them back just by like, hey, here's fifty percent off, come back and try us again, right? So you've got to always be working on building that brand with day to day emails, your your social ads, your paid search, whatever it might be. When you were developing this lapse purchase series and the types of messaging that went into there, obviously discounts were kind of probably taken off the table pretty early on. How did you choose what type of messaging that would would be effective with engaging people that shopped and are just they're not shopping now either because they're not ready to or because you might have potentially lost them, right? It was too much work to do X, Y, Z or whatever it might be. Sure. How did you determine what type of messaging to go into that lapse purchaser series? Well, obviously discounts are something that people it's exciting for people. If you know you see an email that says, hey, 50% off, that's that's very nice. So obviously I want to catch people's eyes. So if I if I were to offer someone free shipping, well, there's that is technically a discount. It's just sure. it's not 50% off a, a you know high value item, which is our, our jeans are not inexpensive by any means, but it's not the same level of, of discount that I'm offering. But the other thing that we do is there's a specific uh, tool within OmniSend called the Product Recommender. So I really like this because it allows me to send each customer a very unique email where it's like based off of other customer trends and you know your, even your own behavior on the website, here are some products that you might like. So we're able to send somebody a very personalized message where it's like, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Um, Here are some products that, you know, customers like you are looking at. And I know from my own personal experience, I like that kind of stuff. For example, like I'm I'm a big movie guy. I love movies. And so if I'm watching, you know, a movie review, I want to know what other movies this person who maybe I respect their movie reviews. I want to know what other movies they like. What is their top 10 list of movies? So if I'm a consumer and other people are similar to me and they're making certain purchases, that could be kind of interesting to me. Oh, really? That that's if I were to look at that email and say, Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll 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 check that out. Whether or not I purchase, you know, who knows? But it's it's fun and interesting to know what other people within my hobby and raw denim, I, I also treat it like a hobby. It's fun to know what other people who are similar to me are are also looking at. You say that, I immediately think of that Seinfeld episode where Lane's looking at, I forgot the guy's name, but the the movies, right? He was in like a blockbuster type thing. Gene. It's like, oh, that's a Gene recommendation. 
Yeah, yeah. He yeah, turned yeah. out to be like a 16 year old kid, right? So, <laughs> right. <laughs> I missed that. You know, like, I, you know, I'm, I, I have a pretty extensive movie collection and, uh, I do miss the video store. I just, I loved going into movie stores and there was always the selection of, uh, you know, the staff, a Bay Street. There's a store in Toronto, Bay Street video, I think. And, uh, it's one of the, it's, it's a, they do rental still and they have an incredible assortment of, uh, films for sale and they always have a, a great, uh, you know, staff selection there. So. I do appreciate that reference. There you go. So, Bayzad, you guys have three messages sending in your Labs Purchaser series right now. Curious question, and there, there's there's no right or wrong answer to this. Like, how did you decide that three is the right number? Was it just the amount of content? It's like, okay, these are what we want to convey, and that's kind of good there. Or was there some sort of magic science behind me? Like, hey, three is what everyone else is doing. How'd you come up with that number? The first email in the Labs email series actually isn't a like come and make another purchase it's tell us how we did it's actually an ask for your customer feedback so within that series we we do have you know three emails going up but the first email has absolutely nothing to do with trying to get your business again it, in fact it's it's been a good amount of time you've had the product in your hands for a while let us know what you think. And uh, people respond to that. So it's a good, I think it's just a good way to like, you know, I'm trying to think of analogy, but I can't, but I think it's just a good way to uh, pique someone's interest and have that lifeline out there and say, Hey, here's a, here's now we've got some communication going. And then the emails that will precede that are a little bit more tailored to, Hey, check out some new product. And then, yeah, that's how that goes. That's really interesting you said that. I want to follow up on that first one because one thing I always used to tell when I was consulting or, or doing post-purchase presentations is having one of these feedback type emails earlier on after, like, say, a user's very first purchase with you. Mm -hmm. Let's say quicker buying cycle, but usually that second purchase might come at the 60-day mark. We'll just pick an even number, right? Maybe send that at the 40-day mark to check in because... A lot of times what you find is that the person that doesn't come back, they might have just had a really lousy experience, right? The shipping, which might be out of control, but the shipping was bad or the product was damaged or it didn't work or it just looked like it was cheap, but it looked nicer online, right? And, mm -hmm. But it's not enough for them to really complain. They just won't shop with you again. You said people are responding to this, to this message that you guys are sending. I'm curious, the responses coming back, has it been a, a valuable customer service tool in retaining potentially lost customers or is it maybe education it's like oh, i don't really know how to do this right can you help me out can you walk us through a little bit about what a typical response on that message might be most of them i mean the vast majority of them are positive you know what the thing that we ask for in customers here is is to provide uh, a review of their experience so they'll post on google reviews for example and our review rate is very high. I mean, we have a lot of five stars. In fact, most of the responses are, are five star reviews. And I think that speaks to something because if you ask somebody to provide feedback, just the beast of the internet, I, I just find that most people are pretty negative when it comes to store reviews or, or just, you know, experience reviews. Most people want to when they're happy, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of these things where, you know, you may not say something, but if you're upset, you're definitely going to say something. So a lot of these online reviews are often just a place of negativity. And despite that, our reviews are very, very, very overwhelmingly high. And I think that that speaks to the way we treat our customers and the way we communicate and the product that we put out. We're very, focused on ensuring customer satisfaction. Even on my customer service side, you know, the guys who, who, who have to answer those emails, we just stress so much that customer experience is, is definitely key. If customers upset, you, you got to turn it around. You got to make them feel good. And you know, that's, that's not always going to happen, but that is certainly our drive. And at almost any case, we're going to try and make the customer happy. I mean, there are, there are certain, you know, circumstances where there's things that are out of your control but uh the weird not not to deviate too far but the weird ones are the ones who are like clearly someone is trying to scam your website and then they're just beating you down with like a million different like you know things 
and it's like we already know it's a fake credit card. <laughs> stop! Stop! <laughs> That's my credit you, card, you, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes you get an eat like this is deviating, but like you, you know, you you'll get a customer purchase, and it's like ten or fifteen credit card attempts, and it's like okay, you have the last one that went through, and like the the security filter is like red, like don't ship it, and you're like. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to cancel this order. I, it, it got through, but we're going to have to cancel it. And they're like, <laughs> why? And then, you know, you're just dealing with this mega back and forth. And you don't want to be like, obviously, you don't want to accuse anyone of anything. But it's like, you know, less than 0.1% of our customers have had, you know, 15 uh, you know credit card attempts that failed before they had one that went into a f- high flag fraud category. I'm pretty sure you're not being honest with us. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's really cool that, to, to see that people are responding to that email and that you guys are, uh, obviously, is a testament to your brand and this, the culture you guys have with trying to fix problems, if there are problems, but with the positive reviews as well, that people are just responding favorably to those as well. So I think it's a really important lesson for anyone who's listening today. The mentality with lapsed purchasers or post-purchase whatever is to often incentivize or to make it about shopping, right? Where it doesn't have to be about shopping and be about a checking in on the experience just to make sure everything's going okay. And I think that's a really important mm-hmm. thing for people to take away from this. We mentioned very early on in this conversation, you're kind of a one-person wrecking crew from the email side over there. So I mentioned that this is going to be similar to what a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably faced with. They're doing it themselves. They're probably doing email while they're listening to this in the background. When it comes to creating the messages, getting them implemented, inspiration for the messages, like how did you as one person who I will guarantee you have other things to do other than just send emails and create emails, um, how did you go about creating these things? Well, I'm, you know, aside from doing the emails, I also do the social media. I also do the product development. I'm also the general manager of, of the company. So, you know, whether that's retail or online, you know, even, even you know, product creation, website building, like... We're a small company. I'm, I'm sure many of the, the listeners here are also small companies. Maybe they're they're just one person companies. We're a little bit more than one person, but I was the first employee at this company. So every step of the way from ev- everything that we've ever done, I've I've had my hands in. So I've I've got a pretty good grip on what goes on company wide and what goes on with our customers. I do two hour live streams every week with our customers, for example. So when it comes to messaging and branding. This is something that I helped develop from the very beginning. You know, we had, we had no idea what ki- type of information our customers would like. So just through trial and error over the years, you know, trying to figure out what kind of stuff our customers react to. So through our email marketing, it's often letting people know about upcoming products. So we have a, a product release. So we, we'll create a blog post, which I, I will write. We'll, we will create, uh, imagery, which I often will shoot and. So I put that all together. I, I put a story together. I let the customers know that this is coming. Here's all the information you need to know about it. And here's the release time. Here's the release dates. And uh, usually we will send a couple of emails with that information throughout a short period of time leading up to the release of any particular product. You know, not everybody opens every email. So, you know, sometimes you have to, to repeat information. But I think it's just being in tune with the customer as being as close to the customer as possible allows me to create stories and information for them that they're going to find relevant. With this three message series on the lap side, is that something, if you remember how long it's been running for, but is it something where you put all messages out at once or did you implement one message and then just add a second one to it and then add a third one to it as you went? I think I played around with it for sure. So I think it's always been three messages, but I, I I played around with the dates a little bit because I didn't want to bombard people also with this type of stuff. So I don't want our emails to be bothersome. You know, they're they're going to come through when here and there. But I find that if you start sending too many emails, people just start tuning them out because it's not it's not special anymore. If you're getting an email every single day from a company, well, hey, maybe that works for you. I know from my personal behavior, you know, if I'm getting an email from a particular company every day, I don't open that email every day. I'll open that email every now and then. And, you know, maybe I miss some information, but I have other companies that I subscribe to and I know they don't send me emails every day. And then when they do send me an email, it's usually for something that I'm 
probably going to be interested in, maybe like a new release or something like that. So I, I tend to open those more often. So I think that by there are certain automations that we have for customer retention, but my general emails, I don't, I don't spam. I really just try not to send people too, too many emails so that they don't tune me out. So what I'm taking away from this is kind of put yourself in the customer's shoes, figure out what they might want, right? Try to be in tune with your customers, pay attention to these things, right? Really hone on the brand, the customer experience. And ultimately, if you are in tune with those things, it will help guide the content that you're going to put into any sort of automated messages you have. Did I do a good job of summing that up? Yeah, I think so. You just a minute ago told us 50 different things you do. Uh, and none of them seem very short, right? They all seem very time consuming and intensive. <laughs> so if if someone's listening, they're thinking to themselves, man, I would love to do something like that. I don't have the time to do it. I don't know where to start, whatever it might be. Is there any sort of advice that you might be able to offer those people? Yeah, stop sleeping. Um, sleeping gets in the way <laughs> of practically everything you do in your life. Try to reduce your sleeping time to about four hours a day at most. And then you'll find you'll have a lot more time to do everything. <laughs> I'm serious and also joking. But just be as smart with your time as possible. With our emails, we have our automations that handle a lot. I mean, you know, the customer retention emails, maybe it's a birthday reminder email or something like that, you know, high value customer emails. Those type of things, you can set it and you can forget it. And those are going to work for you. But with everything else, even when we're doing product photography, sometimes it's just me in my living room shooting on the floor. And it takes practice. But the more you do something, the better you'll get at doing it. And you'll start to realize all the stuff that you don't need to do anymore. And just try to figure out what the most efficient way it is to get whatever task it is that needs to be done, done. There's a lot of fluff. You'd be surprised how much stuff you could actually cut out while still making a relevant and uh, a still relevant uh, uh, you know, piece of content. I appreciate it. So anything maybe that came up during the conversation today that you feel is important that maybe I neglected to ask you? I don't think so. You know, when it comes to the customer retention, I think we've, we've covered practically everything. Very good. I've got to ask you, I wasn't planning on asking you any sort of fun questions, which I typically do. You said you, you're a movie buff. I have these conversations with friends and, and family all the time. Is there a most overrated kind of popular movie that you, you could point to? Most overrated popular movie? I don't know. I'm the kind of guy who takes a look at criticisms of pop music and then I turn it around and say, well, why are you even, why do you care? Like, is there over, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I remember when everyone ragged on Justin Bieber. Oh, he's this kid with stupid hair. And I'm like, why do you care? You're an adult. This is a, this guy's a, a singing for teenage girls. Like, <laughs> how does this affect you in any way? And why are you so upset that he's popular with the audience that he's popular with? You just let the guy live, man. Yeah, let him live. He's doing a good job. He's a young, talented kid. Let him, let him, let him do his thing. But most overrated popular movie? Oh, I wish I was set up for this. I, I can't think of one right now. Um, darn it. I really want to have a good answer for this. Now I don't. You know, well, this will be a cliffhanger. When, when this episode, you know, you're going to have time when the episode goes live, you can tweet it out or Instagram it or whatever, right? So you got time to think about it if you want. <laughs> now, this is going to bother me all day now. I'm looking at my movie wall. There's, almost 1500 movies here and uh i'm trying to point out one that i think is an overrated popular one anyways i'll give you mine real quick just so <laughs> when you're going through the day-to-day -day, you're just not distracted yeah. right because i don't want to take my time away from your day uh, dazed and confused is mine i i don't get it i don't get it okay no no i mean i i, I like that movie so uh, everyone does <laughs> yeah everyone does everyone does I, I mean some there are some movies that are just you know, like a movie like Inception where people are like, I didn't get it. I'm like, yeah, I guess. But like, you know, it takes, it's a long movie. So maybe some people don't want to rewatch it or or have the time to rewatch, you know, a long movie several times. But again, I think maybe that's one, one movie that some people think are over is overrated. I don't think it's overrated. I think it's a great movie. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer this. I, I Like a lot of popular movies I, te I, 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 I tend to like. It's sometimes like these arty movies that I'll watch that people give high praise to. And I'm just like, that was awful. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm going to try to get back right on rails here to, to kind of close this out here. So if someone wants to reach out to you with any questions, uh, say hello or the website, what's the best way? We'll have it in the show notes, but what's the best way verbally to uh, to get a hold of either you or the, the website? Sure. So you can find us on Instagram at Naked and Famous Denim. I run the the Instagram account there, so you can... If you're, if you're messaging anybody, it's good. It's going to be me. We're also on YouTube, uh, Naked and Famous Denim on YouTube. We're on Twitter, but not really. NF Denim over on Twitter, nakedandfamousdenim.com. You know, you can send us an email through there as well. So if you want to find me, there's um, a, a bunch of different ways. Bezad Trinos, everyone, Chief Denim and Taku at Naked and Famous. Uh, Bezad, thanks so much for your time today. Enjoy the conversation both before we recorded, during recording, and then when we went off the rails at the end. I thought it was great. So uh, thanks again so much for your time. I hope someone takes the advantage and reaches out to you, but we'll definitely chat again soon. So thanks again. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Very welcome. Cheers. Now it's time for the workflow. And for our final segment today, I'd like to bring in Daniel Heck, affectionately here known as Danny, who is a customer success manager here at OmniSend. Now, Danny works with e-commerce clients and advises them on how to improve their email marketing programs and get things implemented, which is really critical. The implementation part is key, and this includes lapse purchaser messaging. So, Danny, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, Greg. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Danny, let's kind of jump into it with uh, kind of foundational background. So a lot of people are going, well, I don't really know what a customer success manager does. So why don't you just give us a real brief introduction of yourself, you know, where you're based and uh, how you work and interact with clients on a day-to-day basis. Sure, sure. I am located in Charleston, South Carolina, working remotely as many of us are these days, working with people all around mostly the country and a little from some other countries as well. Basically, a customer success manager is a consultant. What we are is an extension of their team. So basically, we're here to help customers onboard coming from another e-commerce platform and using a different, maybe a different ESP, and then learning how to use our product. What do we have to offer? What we have to offer is going to be good for them and what features for them to use. Kind of just maybe helping them show how to analyze what they're using and if it's worth it to continue doing something specific and then how to use our product for their benefit. Everyone I've spoken with, including Bayzad from Naked and Famous, who we just got off with, has said that they are either doing email all alone or they are working with a very small team. So by small, I mean maybe two, maybe three people, but they're all doing other things on top of the email, which is pretty, from my experience, pretty common, even with larger companies they are kind of in that same boat. Is this kind of the same thing that you see when you're working with your clients as well? Absolutely. Just working with different customers each day. I find that I'm working from somebody that could be the director of marketing to the CEO to somebody that's a graphic designer or social media marketing manager. I mean, the titles run the gamut. Their responsibilities run the gamut. So you could have somebody that has a lot on their plate and they only have a very little bit of time or their job is solely specifically for email marketing, but they haven't had any exposure to it. So we go from some people that might have had some experience to somebody that doesn't have any idea how to use the platform or hasn't used any other one. So it's definitely exciting to teach them what we have to offer and where even to start. Very good. And I think that really brings me to why I wanted to have you on the podcast today is to talk about that, right? So part of your job is to help people implement these things because we could talk about email marketing all day long. We could talk about automation, how much revenue it drives. And if you're not doing it, you're not realizing the revenue. You're not realizing the increased sales. And part of your job is to be, like you said, an extension of their team a little bit and help them get along. So I want to talk about kind of your approach to help teams execute, whether it's doing it for them, whether it's helping them out, whether it's guiding them and kind of these these things that you found over time working with clients that you find to be more successful for actually getting them to do things. So I want to kind of dig into that a little bit with you. Now, one of the prerequisites for that is that you might have 10 different ideas, like you should be doing X, Y, Z, right? Our stats report will tell you that if you do these things, you'll increase your sales, but we have to be real here. And we have to understand that people cannot do 10 things all at once. It it just, it's not reality. So you then need to be very thoughtful about what you present to customers, right? Hey, we should do a card abandonment and here's why and knowing the time limitations and the resource limitations that they may have. So 
we could talk about this specifically with Lapse Purchaser, but in general as well. It doesn't have to be just about Lapse Purchaser because you need to be thoughtful. Are there tools you use or how do you identify what to approach a customer with to say, okay, this is what I think your next thing should be. And if you want to make it very specific to Lapse Purchase, you certainly can, but don't feel limited there. How do you decide what to approach customers with to say, hey, this is what I think you have some revenue driving opportunity? So basically, as a CSM, we do have a checklist in our mind of things that we want to make sure everybody has implemented, such as a welcome series or a card abandonment, things that we know and have been proven in the past to be very high yielding for them and something that we don't want them to miss out on. So I usually start with those. And if they have them, it's great. And we'll move on from there. So I start with the ones that we know we want them to implement. And then from there, we look at what they could use as a company. If they sell two products and they work together, a cross-sell automation might be an an obvious one that we want them to do. So based on what specific products they have is going to be what I use for my recommendations. Definitely explaining why is a big part of it so that it helps them realize, all right, you know what? She's telling me that this is going to be a good idea and this is going to work with our products and our company. Then, you know, let me focus on this. So that's one of the reasons that I recommend things. We often get a lot of customers that are motivated and and ready to do things, but they don't really know where to start. Or if they've done a couple things, they often ask us, what's next? What else can I do? So in that aspect, and when I get those scenarios, that's when I can dig into some of these more, these other automations like lapsed purchasing. When I do want to recommend that one, I often check out a segment and look at how many people haven't purchased in a while or haven't opened emails in a while. And that's when I can start to recommend these other automations because we want to make sure that we are engaging their customers that they haven't heard from in a while. So you said something very interesting there, and that is you may approach them with something or they may approach you with something, but they don't really know where to start. And that's kind of where your expertise comes in Mm -hmm. to kind of guide them along. Let me actually pose that question. Let's talk about this in terms of, say, lapse purchaser. So where do you start? Like how, let's say you're going to approach a customer with, hey, naked and famous, right? Hey, you know, Bayzad, I think you guys have an opportunity for lapse purchaser messaging here. Where do you start? Do you look at something specific, like a certain segment inside the platform? Do you just look at, hey, this is an opportunity that we see is doing well. So let's talk about it and then try to figure out what type of messaging works best for you. Like where is that starting point for you? Say you're approaching someone with lapse purchaser. Yeah, really, one of the things I think is eye-opening to our customers is really understanding their audience and their contact list. And that's something that nobody, like a lot of people don't really pay attention to. So you want to know your VIP customers. You want to know your lapsed purchasers. You want to know the people that aren't opening any emails so that you can keep your list clean. So I dig into their segments and create segments for them so that they can see it. So something, we also have a customer lifecycle dashboard, which really helps us understand where customers are in their journey. Have they recently bought? Are they purchasing often? Those kinds of things. So creating a segment to show them where a large portion of their customers are sitting and then what automation goes with that is really where how I approach it. And then we have a good discussion on it and then we decide which ones will work for them. So that's really cool. You mentioned the well, you mentioned a couple of things I want to circle back to. The customer analytics dashboard, not the plug OmniSend, but I work for OmniSend. So let's just call it what it is, right? Let's be transparent here. Really cool, right? So I've worked in the email space for a long time, practitioner, consultant. It's a really cool dashboard. So if you are a current OmniSend client, you know, certainly take a look at that dashboard if you haven't yet, if you want to kind of check it out. And if you're not, certainly sign up for a free trial and things like that and check those things out. Really cool, helpful, impactful, but more so I would say for those customers that maybe don't have those resources and don't want to create, like think about creating 20 different segments to, to slice and dice that we kind of do that for you. So really cool tool. You mentioned something right before that with helping them understand which messages or what type of messaging may be most suitable for their brand. Can you elaborate on that a little bit. And what I mean by that may be to help guide you along is, you know, we'll say Negan Famous or we'll say XYZ company. Do you look for other examples from companies in that same space? Do you just look at any examples from companies and say, okay, what do we want to hit on here from a lapsed purchaser messaging, knowing that 
I've looked into the list and I understand the audiences. Like, how do you approach the right messaging for the right brand? I think it's going to depend on like the products. Are they the type that people will buy a bunch of different products from them on a regular basis? Or are they selling luxury goods where people purchase once per year or something like that? Then it's going to be a little bit different on how we approach it how we approach an automation for lapse purchasing. Are you going to do, we typically recommend at least a few messages, perhaps three to give people time to decide to engage again and purchase and maybe putting a certain time frame in between those messages will depend again on the types of products that they sell or how often they sell. So that's really cool. Cause when I was talking to Beza had right before this, he had mentioned the same thing, right? It's kind of a, a higher price product, but It also takes, he said, a year to kind of wear in jeans and get those fade marks. So you're not necessarily buying a new pair of jeans the next month. So you just said, right, it could be a luxury product where they buy once a year. How do you really determine laps at that point? And it was the exact scenario that Bayzad had laid out for me. It's like, well, they're not necessarily laps, but in some sense they are lapsed, right? So how do we approach that messaging? And it was a challenge for him, right, to figure out what the right timing is, what the right messaging in there is. So. I think your point of, hey, if you really understand the products you're selling, the audience you have, their buying patterns, which the dashboard can certainly help you, it kind of shakes that out a little bit. I want to shift gears a little bit to implementation because this is the one thing that I've always found that companies have a real struggle with is, okay, you know, I want to do a welcome series. I want to do a card abandonment series. I want to do a lapse purchase series. It takes work, right? We have to create the message. We have to come up with designs. We have to come up with timing rules, which you help with that. And you just went through some of the ways to do that. But the implementation part of it, we need to create the workflow. We need to put the messages and actually push send, which sometimes can be, or turn on, right? Activate. It's sometimes that could be a scary thing for a company because like, am I doing it right? How do you approach the implementation side when you're dealing with customers? Is it I don't want to lead you to an answer, but I'll kind of give you a somewhat leading if it gives you a helpful kind of pivot there. But do you approach, okay, let's do one message at a time. This is the, say we want to do three messages, four messages. We want to do these. These are the ones we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. But let's do one message at a time. Or do you work with them to go, okay, if it's four messages, let's create the four messages. Let's get the automation going with four, and let's just turn the complete thing on at once. How have you found the best approach to be from an implementation side? So with the implementation, a lot of times we have these types of discussions right at the beginning for onboarding. Right after we get them going, they start looking at automations, how to start, which ones should we use first, how many messages in each one. So again, I think I mentioned this earlier, we always start with the ones that we want them to, we know are the highest yielding and the more popular ones that you want to have, such as a welcome message. If someone's signing up, and you have a pop-up or you have ways of collecting subscribers, you want that first message to go out. So we definitely want to start with that one. In the onboarding, I walk through how to create automations, and then we do one at a time. We do one step at a time. So when people get a little overwhelmed or they have a lack of time or a lack of resources, it's definitely one step at a time. So we will start with one. I have recurring phone calls with people, especially as they're setting up their accounts with Omnisend. And then After that first one's set, I'll look it over, tell them to start it, we're good to go. And then after that one, we decide which one are we doing next. And then we walk through each one at a time. And then that's how we can determine which ones we want to continue with. Automations are really big and a lot of people haven't used them in other ESPs. So these a lot of times are the first time that they're seeing them and their first time that they're realizing that they're going to be an incredible addition to their email strategy. So once we get one going, the good ones with the welcome and the card abandonment, and they see some success with those, they definitely get a little bit more interested in what other opportunities do they have. So one at a time is definitely our the name of the game. Have you found that to be, and the assumption is going to be yes, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Have you found <laughs> that to be, because uh, that's what I do here, right? Mm-hmm. With the one at a time approach, which I personally like the one at a time approach because I find you can execute it a lot quicker than having something over your head. But have you found that to be over time the best way for companies to actually implement? So if you work with, say, company A and company B, and company A does one at a time, and company B says, okay, I'm going to do the same number of messages, but I'm going to do it all at once. Do you find that A implements the entire series quicker by doing one at a time versus company B that? does the same number of messages, but implements it all at once. Does that make sense? 
It does make sense. And that, and that's obviously that's very true, especially if there's any scenarios where there is a step in the automations or a step in the process that they haven't gotten down correctly. So if you do that, you might have to adjust several of the automations because it wasn't done correctly at first. Doing one, making sure that it's successful, then you start going and then you have better ideas of how it's set up. You might need to adjust the trigger because you didn't have a segment correct or something like that. So it's definitely best to do one at a time so that you know that you have it straight. And then once you see the success of that first automation, then you can move on to the next one. That's the moneymaker right there, literally and figuratively. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the main takeaway from this whole conversation here. Danny, I would say, you know, I would ask you this for companies who are tight on resources, and I've asked every guest this so far to offer advice to them. From your perspective, sitting outside an organization, what advice would you offer to companies who are tight on resources but do want to do things like this? We really just need to identify their priorities. So is your priority growing your contact list because you don't have a lot of subscribers and you need more subscribers to get your emails out there? Or do you really just want to focus on campaigns, but maybe touch on an automation or an SMS messaging or something? So we just really need to nail down the priorities and then take it again, one step at a time and break it down as much as, you know, this month, let's just go ahead and get one automation done. Next month, let's go over and try to send one SMS message and see how well that does. And if you break it down and make it seem not so overwhelming and just doing one step at a time, they're more likely to be able to implement these faster with a a little less stress. And then once they see success with each thing that they do and you break it down to maybe one task and then maybe two tasks a month as the more comfortable they get in the platform. So just kind of guiding them through that and letting them know that you're there to help them with each one of those steps. Awesome piece of advice. And folks listening, if you are struggling, that is a recurring theme of what every single person has said so far. So please take it at heart, one thing at a time, right? You can get 10% of 10 things done and you are nowhere. You get 100% of one thing done and you are now 10% closer to the finish while revenue is driving and increasing in the background. So what everyone has said so far is focus on that one thing and focus on your priorities at that point. You'll see progress, which is excellent. So I appreciate the answer. Danny, nothing email marketing related here, but we're going to end this conversation with a final question here about personally, what is the best thing about working at OmniSend for you other than being on this podcast? (laughs) Which has been great. So thank you for that. I love working with OmniSend and working with customers, the small ones, the ones that haven't used an email service provider before or have been thrown into a position and they're, they need help because they don't know where to start. Like I love helping people find the best strategy for their brand and how to use all of our features or find all of our features. A lot of people don't know how much Omnisend has to offer. And when they only come in thinking they're going to use email marketing and then they come out using automations and SMS and push notifications and partnering up with some of our third party integrations and using loyalty points and all of the things that we have to offer and like showing them that and then finding success with that over time with them is just it's extremely exciting. Awesome. Great answer. Danny Heck, everyone, customer success manager here at OmniSend. Danny, thank you so much for your time today. And to everyone listening, thank you for yours. If you have any questions, comments, or want to learn more about how to use email marketing to increase your sales, not your workload, please feel free to email me at podcast at OmniSend.com or visit us at OmniSend.com. Until next time, have a great day and be kind to one another.